Good morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. It's Dr. Ryan here again. Thank you for joining me on another Algorithm and Internal Medicine. It is my honor to wish all you wonderful dads out there a very, very happy Father's Day. Thank you for all the sacrifices you make for your families, and thank you for being hardworking and diligent. And I pray God bless you. <clears throat> you know, they say that a, a truly rich man is one whose children run into his arms when his hands are empty. How true that is. And I was touched by this one. Once a father overheard his son pray, Dear God, make me the kind of man my daddy is. Later that night, the father got on his knees and prayed, Dear God, make me the kind of man that my son wants. And that was amazing, right? So what's Father's Day without a few dad jokes? So please allow me to favor you with a couple of them, even though they're quite bad. <laughs> so I asked dad how he plans to spend the day. He said, well, first mom and I will go pick up our prescription glasses and then we'll see. <laughs> there was a boy who was aged four years old and he says, dad, I've decided to get married. His dad said, wonderful son, do you have a girl in mind? The boy said, yes, grandma. She says, she loves me, I love her too, and she's the best cook and storyteller in the whole wide world. The dad says, that's nice, but we may have a little bit of a problem there. The boy replies, what problem? Dad says, well, she happens to be my mother. How can you marry my mother? The boy said, why not? You married mine. <laughs> that's a good one. I got you there. Okay, and last one. Promise, last one. A kid wanted to be a man, so he asked his father, Dad, what is a man? The dad replied, a dad is a person that takes care of his family. The son then replied, one day I'm going to become a man like mom. <laughs> okay, so let's cut to the chase. Today we're talking about the parents that deliver injury. Once again, a big thank you to everybody who's been watching and uh, uh, subscribing. So, Let's dig in. <clears throat> Hepatocellular liver injury refers to the predominance of aminotransferase elevation uh, in comparison with the alkaline phosphatase, right? Uh, serum bilirubin levels may or may not be elevated. Now, aminotransferase elevation is mild when it is less than five times the upper limit of normal, moderate when it is about five to ten times the upper limit, and marked when it is greater than ten times the upper limit of normal. Uh, the causes of hepatocellular liver injury can be certified into the following categories. We say infectious versus toxic versus vascular versus hereditary versus others. And in patients with hepatocellular liver injury, the degree of aminotransferase elevation and the ratio between AST and ALT levels can help narrow down the differential diagnosis. Marked aminotransferase elevation is usually the result of acute liver injury, which may be caused by acute viral infection, drug toxicity, especially, especially paracetamol. Watch out for that ischemic hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, mushroom toxicity, or Wilson's disease. So let's dig into this. We said infectious causes, there's nine, right? The infamous hepatitis family, hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, right? EBV and CMV, which is Epstein-Barr virus and Sachs-Miguel virus, the two infamous cousins, herpes simplex virus, and varicella zoster virus. Always good to remember these nine infectious causes of hepatitis. Then swapping over to toxic, we said um, alcohol is big, right? Alcohol can cause various degrees of liver injury from steatosis to steatohepatitis to hepatitis to, to then cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. So it's a spectrum. Medication-wise, we often speak to paracetamol, which causes massive increases in your transaminase levels. Other examples can be isoniazid from your TB drugs, can be steroids, which can cause steroid-induced hepatitis or statins as well, right? Recreational drugs, very important. Iron as well, and we see this in the context of hemochromatosis, but just iron itself in large amounts is toxic to the liver. Mushrooms, the classic example that's quoted that causes a fulminating hepatic failure is Amanita phylloides mushrooms with a greenish hue on the undersurface. You know all those deals right there. Right, vascular, we speak to ischemia. So any kind of shock with a diminished perfusion of the liver, but also congestion in the setting of right sided heart failure um, or even constrictive pericarditis where the liver becomes congested. Right, but Shari syndrome as well in the setting of hepatic vein thrombus thrombosis. Then hereditary issues, hemochromatosis, um, right, we had a situation of iron overload, all right, Wilson's disease as well, which otherwise called hepatolenticular degeneration, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which often also leads to emphysema. Okay, watch out for those. Others, especially um, in the setting of the increased prevalence of obesity that we're seeing right now, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, 
or non alcoholic diarrhea hepatitis. <clears throat> Autoimmune hepatitis, often in setting of our connective tissue disorders, also accompanied by an ANF, but a lot of things can throw off ANFs, right? But what is relatively specific for this is your anti smooth muscle and your anti liver kidney microsomal antibody. There's two different kinds of AIH <clears throat> acute biliary obstruction. HELP syndrome stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets usually setting, uh, sorry, happens in the setting of preeclampsia. Celiac disease, otherwise called and gluten sensitive enteropathy, sorry about that, where you look at your anti gluten, anti endomycial antibodies, and the anti transcriptaminase antibodies, all right? So there's a whole truckload of causes for hepatocellular liver injury. This is a nice, handy um, diagrammatic representation of hepatitis B from medcomic.com. So we see here, sorry, it's a bit small, but viral antigens are displayed on the surface of infected hepatocytes, okay? And the cytotoxic T cells, uh, this mean looking gangster looking cell represents that it mediates an immune attack against the viral antigens causing inflammation and necrosis and after entering the blood hbv uh, infects the hepatocytes now hepatitis uh, virus we characterize by a variety of different antigens and antibodies so we speak of the hepatitis b surface antigen this is the serological hallmark of hepatitis b viral infection and can indicate an acute or chronic infection okay then we have the hepatitis B E antigen, which indicates a high likelihood of transmissibility. The finding of anti um, hepatitis B E antibodies indicates low infectivity, but transmission can still occur. Then we have the hepatitis B core antibodies, uh, IgM, which indicates acute infection, and IgG core, which indicates past infection, right? And then hepatitis B surface antibodies are markers of immunity. All right. That's the handy mnemonic I love uh, speaking to different causes of hepatosplenomegaly. So break it down, H stands for hematological uh, in the way of minor proliferative diseases, thalassemia. E stands for EBV, but EBV's cousin is CMV and rubella also comes in there. P stands for portal hypertension, A for amyloidosis, T all goes together, right? That's toxoplasmosis, S for sarcoidosis, P for pernicious anemia, LE goes together for leishmaniasis. And you think about leishmaniasis, you also think about malaria and filariasis as well. Bucuraria, Bancrofti. Right? N is for Neiman Pix disease, which is a glycogen storage disease. You also think about Hurler's and Gaucher's disease, which fit into the same category. Omegaly goes together for acromegaly. It's a beautiful mnemonic and a way to remember causes of hepatosplenomegaly. The actual word, hepatosplenomegaly. Nice one. Right? Then here's another handy mnemonic to remember the precipitants for hepatic encephalopathy. So H is hypokalemia, E is excess dietary protein, P is overzealous paracentesis, over three to five liters per day, A stands for anuria, just to remember that uremia can also precipitate hepatic encephalopathy, right? And T, T is trauma, I is T speaks to infections, C for constipation, S for sedatives, G for GI hemorrhage, P is for porosystemic shunting, T is for triastatic antidepressant, all right? So as always, to keep things fresh and exciting, here's a Mayo Clinic uh, OSCE example. A 30-year-old man presents with personality changes, jaundice, joint pain, and this eye finding. Oh dear. This looks like a case of flasher ring on slit lamp, man. The disease associated with these findings is caused by defects in metabolism of which element? And it's our beloved copper. So just a little bit about Wilson's disease, also called hepatolenticular degeneration. Interestingly, it was first described by Westphal not by Wilson, in the year 1883, a long time ago. It is an autosomal recessive defect in biliary excretion of copper that results in deposition in the liver, brain, and cornea, among other tissues. Like we said, Kaiser Fleischer rings are more frequent in patients with neurological sequelae, right? Neurological findings include personality change, rigidity, tremor, spasticity, dysarthria, dysphagia. Liver manifestations include cirrhosis, cholestasis, and today's topic, hepatitis, among others. Arthropathy occurs in 50% of patients, and Wilson's was universally fatal until 1951 when it was discovered uh, that uh, a, a British anti leucocyte interesting, a chelator used for arsenic poisoning, increased urinary copper excretion and resulted in reversal of the tremor and rigidity of Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is now treated with penicillinamine, which increases the urine excretion of copper with or without zinc, uh, which inhibits copper absorption in the GIT, right? You can also do a liver biopsy and look at the, 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 the copper content in there. Okay, so um, today being Father's Day, I just want to place on record my special thanks and appreciation to my beautiful wife. Thanks, babe, for all that you do. You know, they say that um, 
but you know, I, I actually would not be half the man I am had it not been for my beautiful wife standing right alongside me. And they say any man can be a father, but it takes someone special to be a dad. All right. What does the Bible say uh, to fathers? I just want to encourage you today. The book of Proverbs chapter 20 verse 7 says, The righteous man walks in integrity. His children are blessed after him. The book of Psalm chapter 103 verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Ephesians chapter 6 uh, verse 1 to 4 uh, tells us, and here uh, Paul is speaking to the Ephesians and telling them, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Beautiful. Listen to this. That it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. At the same token, he said, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So I hope that you have been encouraged and blessed. To your dads, have a fantastic Father's Day. I'm going to see you tomorrow with another algorithm in gastroenterology. God bless. Be safe.